First thing I wanted to ask you is, has your approach to producing Hunger Games movies changed from 2015 to now? Because it's only been eight years, but there's been a seismic shift in like distribution models and how people like to consume content. Um, you know, I would say that it, you know, it has changed because also like I'm always learning on the job. So I've learned a lot in the last eight years. I've also made a lot more television. So that really influences your approach to production, what you believe is possible. Um, and what you think you can get done in a day really changes when you switch from features to TV. And I think Francis and I both really felt the benefit of having done uh, television in the intervening years and how it informed our approach to production this time around. I have to follow up on something you just said. Can you name something that you accomplished on this set that would make maybe you producing the very first Hunger Games movie go like, my God, I cannot believe we'd be able to pull off that with one of these films one day? Well, I mean, some of it is just some of the audacity of it. Honestly, if somebody t said to you, you know, you're going to, I mean, we started out shooting these movies, you know, first one was in North Carolina, and then we moved on in the subsequent movies to Atlanta, and then either Paris and Berlin, or Atlanta and Hawaii. So we had, you know, and this one we shot all in Eastern Europe. But if you had told me that you'd be able to shut down Karl Marx Ali, like this iconic street in the middle of Berlin that was like the emblem of East Berlin at the peak of its powers, um, and that we would be able to make our capital um, unfold this way right in the heart of Berlin, I, I would not have believed you given how much inventing we did early on and then to switch, like say, to a European-based production with an amazing production designer and to see this incredible architecture at, that we had available to us and how much we were able to do practically mm. was amazing. Yes, you feel the effects of that while you're watching the film. I have to go back to the very beginning and ask you a question I feel like you might have been asked before, but this was one of the first things that crossed my mind when I finished reading the book. Did you ever consider splitting Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes into two movies instead of one? We never really did. I think Francis and I both felt that, like, it was very hard for us to ever figure out how to do Mockingjay all in one. But I also feel the audiences get they get frustrated when you leave them hanging. And they, even if you're doing it from the inside out, they feel like it's from the outside in. They feel like, oh, you're just trying to like maximize your upside. And we felt like, no, this is meant to be one story. This is the story of, you know, the, the birth of a villain. And how does a, a, a young man who's not set in who he is, who's still figuring out who he is, become you know, the man who we now know as President Coriolanus Snow. Where does that turn happen and why does it happen? Um, so that was really what we, you know, set out to understand. Another thing I have wondered, because I remember, I think it was in 2017, there was some news that broke that you were considering Hunger Games spinoffs, and that was before Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes existed. Would you ever, even at this point, continue the franchise without source material from Suzanne to work with? I, you know, for me, like... Suzanne is my North Star. If she has a story she wants to tell, I am ready, willing, and able to tell it. Um, if there were a story she wanted to tell that wasn't based on a book but was an idea of hers that she knew what she wanted to do with it, I'd be up for that. I just would never do any of it without her at my side. I just, she's, you know, I, she is uh, the source of all things relevant and important to these series. And, you know, I would never presume to know um, how to do it without her. I have so much respect for that mentality, but I'm going to ask you personally, if there is one corner of any of these books you would want to explore further and build a story out of, what would you choose and why? Well, I personally have a lot of curiosity about uh, District 13 and the idea of like this district that was once like, you know, beloved. And what did they do to be bombed out of existence. Why did they defy? And I'm always really curious, like, did they defy because they weren't willing to send people to the Hunger Games? You know, their own kids to the Hunger Games? Why did this kind of, like, you know, uh, favored child become the bastard child of the, of, of the country? And why did they defy 
the Capitol when nobody else did. That always interests me. Sign me up for that idea. This new movie has also made me even more obsessed with Tigress because Hunter's performance is absolutely perfect. So I want a whole movie for that character. Oh, I could for sure live with a lot more Tigress. <laughs> yeah. So going into the production with this one now, of all of the scenes or the locations or anything that you had to tackle to make this movie happen at the beginning of production, which one did you think would be the most difficult to pull off? And then ultimately, was that the most challenging or did a different scene catch you by surprise? Um, I mean, the, some of the things that we hope to accomplish in terms of being able to, like, say, shut down Mm. Karl Marx Ali, like, I was like, they're never going to let us do that. We're never going to be able to do that. And amazingly, we had such an incredible team on the ground that we were able to get access to these locations. There was a lot of question about, like, some of our locations, whether we could afford them, like that amazing location where the um, tributes are interviewed by their mentors. And that was, like, an incredibly dramatic like powerful fascist architecture that makes you feel so tiny. Um, that sequence was up in the air because we had to go to Leipzig for like two days. And like that's never like a studio's favorite thing is we're going to go to a different city and move our whole crew and cast for two days. But once we saw that location, we were like, we have to have that location. And we have to figure out how to hold on to it. So there were kind of those fights along the way of like, how do you hold on to the things that you think would really have an impact? And how do you give up things that you think you might not need? You know, like, do you have to have, as he's walking to school, an explosion? Or could you go to Leipzig instead? <laughs> those kinds of things. It makes sense. Another high priority thing I have to ask you about, because it was something that was on my mind after reading the book, is incorporating the music. What conversations did you have with, with Francis, Rachel, and the rest of the team in order to make sure that Lucy's Lucy Gray's music always felt like like beautiful and pristine but also raw and real within that world. Well, I mean, I think that was always a big question is knowing that on the one hand with a musical theater background, Rachel has the capacity to sing and act at the same time and to do both really well because it's hard to do either one well, let alone both at the same time. And certainly, Lucy Gray is a performer. We talked a lot about like Dolly Parton as an inspiration of somebody whose goal is to entertain and not to, um, there's nothing didactic about her. She is wants everybody to feel that her music is made for them, that this song is for you. And so we wanted in, in, in Rachel somebody who could make every person in the audience feel like she's singing this song to me and what it feels like for someone like Snow to know she actually really is singing this song to me. But being able to find somebody in Rachel who could deliver that and yet bring the rawness and not go into like flip the switch and go to like show tune mode, but actually really believing that this is, you know, um, that this is her music, that she's written this music, and that this is like the music that uh, embodies her experience. And I also love, of course, how, you know, Suzanne felt that these stories that are passed on through songs, and you, then you think about how these stories are passed on and these songs and the impact they have on Katniss all those years later is something really fun, I think. She nails it perfectly, Cass. Job very well done with oh, her. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, and congratulations. Oh, thank yeah. you.